Welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Lee. Today's guest, Willie Donick of 1025 The Game. He will join us to talk about Vanderbilt football. We thank our presenting sponsor, Wellspire, Nashville's Learning and Development Center. Wellspire offers personal and professional development opportunities in the Gulch neighborhood. Stop by for an event with world-renowned speakers or host an off-site event that will wow your team or your clients. We also thank our co-presenting sponsor, the Well Coffee House, which turns coffee into water and has a mission to bring clean water to the world. The news, as always, presented by our friends at Sutherland & Belk, a Nashville-based injury law firm. Sutherland & Belk is committed to fighting for those who've been injured in car, motorcycle, and truck accidents. Check them out at sbinjurylaw.com. Vanderbilt and Purdue will kick off at 11 Central on Saturday morning. You could see that game on the Big Ten Network. Today's guest line, presented by friends at Bowlin Branch, started by Vanderbilt graduates Scott and Missy Tannen. I wholeheartedly endorse Bowlin Branch sheets because I've slept on them for about six years now and have not gone back. You won't want to go back either. Give it a try. Go to BowlinBranch.com. That's spelled B-O-L-L. Enter the promo code Vandy. Get $50 off your first set of sheet. Try them for a month. You can return them for free, but again, you will not want to. As an added bonus, they are fair trade certified. That means they're made under safe conditions by men and women who were treated and paid fairly. Willie Donick joins us now. He is the play-by-play voice for the Nashville Predators. He has his own show on 1025 The Game. He has been a sports talk regular For years in Nashville, he is a Vanderbilt alum of both the baseball and basketball teams. Willie, thank you for joining us today. Great to be with you again, Chris. Let's talk football. Your impressions of the opener. Well, I I thought, first and foremost, especially given how good Georgia is, and by the way, I thought Georgia looked every bit as good as what we've been hearing the entire offseason. They lived up to the hype. I thought the most important thing was that Vanderbilt did not collapse after they got off to the shaky start. It was 21 nothing pretty quick, and it looked like, hey, this could get really, really ugly. But they settled in, and I thought they, they really fought hard to stay in the game. I, was, I thought if, if there was one thing I was looking for that I didn't see, I was really hoping the offense would flash a little bit more and show – what I think that they they're capable of with their playmakers, but uh, it did, that didn't happen. I think so. There's a lot of questions going into how it translates next week at Purdue, which is a very important game for them. But uh, I, I thought there's a lot of wait and see ba- based on uh, what we saw on Saturday night. Yeah, that's my impression of it too. Now, I think there are some yellow flags at least. I think quarterback play was a yellow flag. Maybe you can explain it by offensive line and first starts and things like that, and and certainly Georgia. But that's kind of the one thing I'm watching because that's got to get a lot better against Purdue. The offensive line, I thought, uh, I guess part of of my evaluation coming out of there was I was a little bit worried going in, especially when I learned that they had not one but two starters that weren't going to be in there. And so – it looked like a trouble area to start the game, and it absolutely was. So the question will be, you know, how much better will it be when they get those guys back? And in the meantime, can they do better? But, yeah, that's, that's probably the biggest concern that I have coming out of the game is the offensive line. And because of that, I thought it was very hard to evaluate Riley Neal. He's, he's clearly got to be better. The results have to be better. But I thought there were a lot of plays where he didn't have much of a chance to do what what they wanted him to do. And the the biggest thing for me that jumped out was I would say, and I I didn't go back and count it. You may have, but a high percentage of the shotgun snaps were out of place. I thought he did a really good job just to field a lot of them and, and, and make a go of it. But when you can't make the center snap better than that, it just throws off a lot of the timing where you don't have much margin for error to begin with against that Georgia defense. So, I thought it was a very difficult situ- situation to evaluate Neil. I thought he kept his, his poise pretty well throughout uh, in terms of, you know, not 
losing his cool or anything like that. Would have been easy to get frustrated at his teammates. But uh, again, it's a wait and see. But because uh, I think people are expecting much, much better things next week at Purdue. Yeah, I think that center quarterback combo, maybe that's a better way to put it. I think that's the situation that's worth monitoring. Well, no question. They, they've got to do a better job of getting the ball to the quarterback. That, that's, that's a huge, huge thing. So that, along with you know, not having your left tackle, that's a, you know, that's a tough blow uh, to, to have now for a few weeks, I understand. But, um, yeah, I, I think it puts, it puts a, lot of, a lot of expectations. It, they've got to be better next week to have a chance. Because I, I watched a lot of the Purdue game against Nevada. Uh, Purdue had total control of the game. They let it get away. They did some things that helped Nevada get back into it. But I, I thought Purdue looked like a team, that, and maybe I'm completely wrong, that even though Purdue's a, a, a touchdown or so favorite, I think if Vanderbilt goes up to Purdue and plays a good game, they can, they can have a chance. That's what you want. You want to have a chance to win that game in the fourth quarter on Saturday. I was surprised the line – was as high as it was. I think it is eight and a half. I do not know if it has fallen since, Willie. But here's the way I think through it. I think everybody expected Purdue to be a better team coming into the season than Vanderbilt, and then you allow three points for the home field advantage. Well, I don't know how much we learned about Vanderbilt. We've talked about the things that I think sort of give them a little bit of a mulligan in game one, and of course, not the least of which is how good Georgia is. But I was a little surprised after Purdue dropped the game to Nevada. You figure, okay, let's say Purdue is a point better and then add three points for home field. That's what I guess the line would be, right around four, somewhere around there. And I'm usually pretty good at predicting those things. I don't know if Vegas has factored in the fact that I think Purdue last year lost to Eastern Michigan early and, of course, turned it around. Maybe that has something to do with it. Or maybe they're more worried about Vanderbilt uh, maybe than, than we are. But that, that was an interesting line. It was not one that I expected to see. It was a little bit higher than I thought. But, uh, you know, it's early in the season. I, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to know where they come up with that this early, the, the perception of Vanderbilt versus the perception of Purdue. I, I don't, it's hard to know. I, I, I don't pretend to know how they come up with that, but it just in watching Purdue, I, I, I feel like we're just going to get a better gauge on what this Vanderbilt team can be. Because here's another thing that I thought of during the Georgia game, Georgia comes out smoking on all cylinders. You know, they ran their basic plays. If you've been watching Georgia the last few years, they did exactly what you knew they were going to do. A lot of quick screens, a lot of high percentage short passes where they let their speed, their athleticism take over. And they, they kind of overwhelmed Vanderbilt early and then Vanderbilt settled in. But, you know, did, did Georgia sort of cruise? I'm not saying, you know, take the foot off the accelerator, but did, did they sort of just say, okay, we don't need to open anything up. Let's keep it simple. To Vanderbilt's credit, they did some great things defensively after that. They got some big stops against that enormous offensive line. But I do wonder, you know, if Georgia needed to score more points, could they have done it? So I think Vanderbilt's defense is going to be in for a challenge against Purdue because they've got some talented guys. Their quarterback looked very talented to me, although he did make some big, big mistakes, and I thought they had trouble protecting him. I thought the pass rush for Vanderbilt was decent against Georgia. Given, given who Georgia is in terms of their offensive line. So I think that'll be an important thing for Vanderbilt's defense next week. Can they get to the quarterback? Yeah, the defensive side and how to analyze that, there's, I think, a multifaceted answer. For one, okay, did Georgia kind of put it on cruise control? Yes and no. I mean, Georgia ran the ball a lot, which Vanderbilt couldn't stop the run. So Georgia kept attacking Vanderbilt with what it could not stop. And, and passing, I think, was a little different. Vanderbilt had a little more success in that, and, and Georgia's got a good passing game, too. Um, you know, on the other hand, that was a team that kept its starting quarterback in until the very end. It was throwing the ball. It was trying to get another touchdown. Yeah. So, and in that sense, it did not take its foot off the gas pedal. I think the thing that maybe nobody's talked about enough is, is yards per play because it was a slow-tempo game. I'm pulling up the stats. Georgia had 63 plays. Vanderbilt had 62. So yards per play was 7.6, which is a lot. I think that really was the thing. 
is if Georgia had gone a lot faster, then I think the stats could have gotten ugly. I think that that is a, a fair point to, to throw out there. I do think that it was sort of a lower possession game and they did run the ball successfully. But I do think part of that is Vanderbilt, to me, did look like they were trying to bend but not break, which I think, you know, under the circumstances, that's how you would want to play Georgia. You don't want to give them any big plays. You know, they got their share of chunks, but they avoided the huge, you know, 50, 60-yard touchdown kind of thing. They forced Georgia to drive the field. And I think their hopes were uh, to, to get some stops in the red zone which they did in the, in the second half. So I thought, you know, that was a factor. But I, I do think it will be a different animal playing against Purdue, who is definitely going to throw the ball a lot more. Because you're right, I, I, Georgia really never had to throw. Of course, you know, that, that was probably a big, big stat to look at was how few times Vanderbilt could get them into third down. I mean, they literally just could not even get them to third down. And when they did, many times it was third and one or third and two. They've got to do a better job on those early downs. Uh, to get him into the third and and long situations. Well, and here's another thing that nobody really talks about is kicking game is sort of a key. I mean, you can't really, to a large degree, control field goals against you. And it, it seems it, it seems to me like opponents hit about ninety percent of their field goals against Vanderbilt, and the longer the more, it almost seems like the more chance they are that they hit those field goals and George of course had an all-american kicker in Rodrigo Blankenship but that was another thing is Georgia got four field goals there um and, and you know they didn't they didn't give you an opportunity in other words they didn't give Vanderbilt an opportunity with missed points they they cashed in on their opportunities pretty well oh yeah and he's a great kicker no question about it um and on the other hand, I, I, I thought it was encouraging that Vanderbilt made their field goals. The punting game looked very good that, to me. I thought the special teams overall was solid. And, I mean, Chris, going back through the history, you know as well as I do that that's been a very shaky area at times. That not only just making the field goals you need to make, but also the coverage and things like that. I, I thought that they did a nice job. That, that, to me, was a thumbs up. Yeah, I guess I was wrong. Blankenship only hit three instead of four. Yeah, three uh, for three, but it, but it, it was amazing to watch him, how easy he goes out there. Well, I don't know, the one was 50 or 52. I mean, it's just, it's a comforting thing if you're a Kirby Smart to know that, w- it, you know, when you stall around the 30, the 35, you really like your chances of him going in there and, and making the kick. What I think more encouraging for Vanderbilt, Riley Gay hit one from 46. We know he can do that. It's the short ones, and the one they hit from 26 was the one that I think was actually the bigger relief because those are the ones that he just had fits with a year ago. Yeah, I, well, I'm hoping, and this is this is uh, something you look at every year, but he did get better as the season went along. He missed way too many kicks that need to be made, have to be made uh, during the, during the context of the games that he missed some of those that, you know, we're talking about a lot of the same field. We're thinking a lot of the same field goals. So I thought that was a, a good start for him, a good confidence boost. Cause I think we would all say that it can snowball, right? If you miss a couple early in the season that you should make, it makes it that much tougher mentally to overcome it. But I would also think as he gets older and matures more, that he, you get a little bit mentally tougher. You get more confident. But that being said, I, I love the start that he got off to and because there's going to be some big, big field goals that he's got to make during the course of the season. Any other thoughts on football before I go to the mailbag, Willie? Well, I think the obvious that, that I know as I get ready to do my show as we, uh, as we discuss here, from the outside, I know that there's going to be a lot of, hey, did you see all the Georgia fans? And I think internally, everybody who's a Vanderbilt fan, you expected that to a degree. I would, I would have a lot of, I would have some questions going into the rest of the season as you regroup from that. And that would be, to me, three questions in terms of how do Georgia fans get their hands on so many tickets? And I, I, and Chris, I don't know. I'm throwing it back at you. Did you did you expect that degree of red 
when, when you walked in there? No, my guess was 65, 35. It was at least 80, and I think it was closer to 85. Yeah. It was it was right. maybe the worst I have seen. I mean, that was a team. Look, okay, I get that Georgia expectations and that fan base right now, it is crazy down there. They are, they are so pumped. Right. They think they're going to compete for a national title, but – Vanderbilt's got two returning All-Americans. It's got a team that comes off a bowl game. I expected more Vanderbilt fans in the stands than I saw. And I wrote about this today. In fact, I just published it before we started doing the podcast. I think you sort of look at the issue the wrong way if you look at it in terms of what can Vanderbilt do to keep opposing fans out. I think you have to look at it if you're Vanderbilt. What do you do to keep opposing fans in? And I think that goes to stuff before the first ticket is ever put on sale to building your own season ticket base. And I think that this has been brought up by fans on our board, Willie. So much of that other side of the stadium opposite from the press box is just other teams' fans. The whole side is that now. A lot of those are faculty tickets. I think you have to do something. You find out what people are doing with those tickets, and if people count on that as an economic benefit, as part of their package, as in, okay, I'm going to take those tickets and resell them and make some money. Okay, give them something else. Give them another half percent of retirement or something like that. Take those tickets away, man. I think that it starts with Vanderbilt controlling what Vanderbilt can control first. And, and then if fans buy the tickets, then then it just is. But that's the side that's got to be addressed is building that fan base and that season ticket base. I think that's well said. I, I, I think back to the 1998 year that Tennessee won the national championship. That's the only other time that I can remember it being that extreme. It, it might have even been more extreme that particular day. But that was a – that was a bad Vanderbilt football team at the end of the season. Opening day to me is a different story for all the reasons you mentioned. You know, you're coming off a pretty good year and you've got expectations of having a decent team. And that being said, it was the perfect storm. You have Georgia on Labor Day weekend, Georgia fans at an all time high of morale. I don't know about all time, but they're they're hungry. They're they're way up there. They feel like they got a chance to win it. So you knew they were gonna be able to get, take as many tickets as they were willing to get their hands on. In fact, I would, I would assume that there were thousands of Georgia fans that might have been around that tried to get tickets that, you know, just came up for the weekend and end up not going to the game. So here's the que- here are the questions that I would have. Number one would be, how many Georgia fans bought the season ticket just to go to that game? Because I know that there have been fans in the past for Alabama, Tennessee, et cetera, that have done it. Reason. Number two, as you kind of hinted at, how many Vanderbilt fans, how many Vanderbilt season ticket holders, whether they be faculty or regular season ticket, whatever category they fall into, decided to sell to Georgia fans? And then uh, the other question I would have would be, how easy did Vanderbilt make it to get to, to have that happen? In other words, for example, the, the Predators – have put in measures. Now, it's, e- it's probably easier for them because of the demand that they have for their tickets and the number of fans that they have and the fact that they've been having a lot of success. They have demand. But they have measures to prohibit the reselling of tickets to other teams' fans. The technology does exist. It takes a lot of work. And it takes a lot of, you know, it, you have to be willing to have some of your fans come back and say, hey, wait a minute. These are my tickets. I should be able to do with, with them whatever I, whatever I want. But there is so there is a price to be paid for that. But these are just questions I would throw at them as they go back and huddle up and say, what's the best way to do this? Um, and, and is there anything that they did differently this year that they have not done in the past? So th- th- I don't know the answers to those questions, but that's what I would float out there. I think that's the most extreme they're going to find themselves in for this year with that. But uh, but I do think going forward, they can learn from that. Well, two things to that from the 30,000-foot view, and I'm not saying that's an invalid idea, but here's two issues they have to work around. First of all, I think in hockey, I, I don't know, you know this better than I do, but I think a lot of those games are weekdays. It's probably hard for a fan 
from Detroit or somewhere to drive down for a Tuesday night game. All football games are weekends, people playing around those, so there's that. The other thing is you run into some issue with your own fan base because you've got so many out-of-town alums. So even the zip code thing mm-hmm. is, is seems to me like it's not as foolproof as it might be, if that's even the right word, in hockey. Oh, yeah. I, I just, I, I'm just saying these are things I just wonder if they've explored these things. And then the third thing would also be when single game tickets go on sale, how do, how do they approach that? How do they try to make it easier for their fans to get their hands on the tickets as opposed to Georgia fans? So it's not easy because as we said, there, there, there's a half the state of Georgia was coming in and they want the tickets. And so part of you are part of you is thinking that, you know, would you rather have empty seats? Or would you, you know, there's a revenue question here, too, to take advantage of. But the biggest thing that I would be concerned with would be the Vanderbilt fans who normally sit. You know where the patches are, right, where they normally sit. And there was too much red in the areas where you used to have in that as your territory. And another thing to keep in mind that, that I've thought about is on TV especially, when you're only seeing the one side of the, of the stands for most of the game, I would have all of my fans, my diehard fans, on that side of the field if I could. I know it's not ideal because the press box area underneath, I know that's where a lot of the, the high-dollar seats are, the bridge, and the, you know, some of the benefits that you get from sitting right there. But I'll tell you what, if, if I could get more of a balanced look on the other side where traditionally the other team's fans sit, that'd be worth thinking about because I think it's a better look on TV. Well... I'm glad you pointed the revenue theme because that was something I meant to get to. Okay, let's say that the average Georgia fan, just for the sake of easy math, paid 100 bucks a ticket and there's 30000 of them there. That's $3 million in revenue from other teams' fans that you've got something to do with now, and I think they should. Yeah. Yeah, uh, fair, fair point. I mean, th- these are all things to consider. I think – So all that would sit back and say, how can this happen? Why does this happen? It's not as easy as you think. These things are very, they're not as, they're not as simple as, well, they haven't won that much, et cetera. The Titans have this issue very, very big, big. And they're on their weekend games. A lot of uh, other teams fans come in for the weekend because it's Nashville, all of these things. And it's, you know, ticket brokers, all of these things factor in where it's harder to control your own ticket sometimes. But it just it takes a lot of research and work to try to do the best you can to balance all these things we're talking about. Here's the other thing. I think that's where Vanderbilt needs to get creative in using Nashville to its advantage. I mean, we've talked about part of the problem is that so many of Vanderbilt's alums, which I know that that's not a diehard fan base in terms of alums and and football affinity, but you'd see travel to bowl games is always a little surprising. has been my experience. I think you get a lot of alums that come to that. We'll we'll start getting alums to think of home games in the same way and, hey, come back to Nashville, see your campus, not not just on homecoming where you're playing Charleston Southern or somebody like that, but make it a bigger deal during the year and see if you can get 1,000 or 2,000 of your own fans back in the stadium, make travel packages only for alums or or for people who have held tickets before uh, with with hotels or things like that. Make that to where you can start marketing the affinity of Nashville and a road trip for the weekend to your own fan base because a lot of them live out of town. Right. These are all ideas that I'm I'm hoping Malcolm Turner, that was his first taste of it, right? The first taste of the challenge, and he got the full extreme the highest extreme that you're going to get. So I'm just hoping that with his background, you know, when they sit down and meet with it, or they probably already done it, I would, I would hope, you know, the last couple of days, say, okay, where do we go from here? That all of these things are, are things that he tries to tackle, comes up with good ideas. And uh, I guess the other thing I would encourage would be, you know, put some resources behind that. You know, how do you research all that? All, all those things that you're saying, you know, it, it takes resources to really pull it off uh, effectively. Yeah, I just kept thinking, this gets worse every year. I mean, since 2016, I'm trying to go back and recall 
a time in an SEC game where Vanderbilt had a decided advantage. I think there's been one or two games. I mean, not decided, but you could tell that Vanderbilt had more of its fans in the stands than the rest of the SEC. But I know this really from 2016 on, and and maybe 2015, my memory of that year fades a bit, but it, it just has gotten worse since about that time frame to where I cannot tell you if my life depended on it, if Vanderbilt's ever had an advantage. I'm sure it has, but but I can't think of one game in conference the last three seasons, or three plus now, where I know Vanderbilt had a, a decided advantage in its own stadium in a conference game. Well, this all, so I'm not even sure that that is necessarily what Malcolm Turner will go back and do, but what comes to mind for me too is do they need to revisit? I mean, this is maybe a discussion we can have for another day, Chris, but down the road, because every team is dealing with this. Tennessee had huge swaths of empty seats, patches. Uh, and, and what's it going to be like when they play Chattanooga uh, coming up in a couple of weeks? I mean, there's every team I think is dealing with issues beyond, well, if our team wins, we're going to fill the stadium. We, we know it's much more complex at Vanderbilt to start with. And then when you add on top in this day and age, the ability for people to watch every game on TV, the challenges are such where you've got to work hard to get people to come to your games. I don't care whether you're a really, really good team. And unless you are top of the top and just on a roll where the fever is at a high pitch, it's not going to be easy to, to fill your seats. So, I mean, down the road, do you need to look at playing some games at the at the new soccer stadium? Will, will that be something where you have a smaller stadium and maybe you create a little bit more demand for, for your team's fans? I mean, these are all things that I think about down the road, big picture. And so, you know, that's something to consider. Yeah, just quick response to that, and then I want to get to the mailbag because I know you've just got a few minutes left. I think the answer is shrinking the stadium, making it really nice, and then building your fan base. If you've got a 35,000-seat stadium and you can somehow build your season ticket base to 20,000, that right there, the math alone of increasing one and decreasing the other, solves a lot of the issue. You just Right now, it's not realistic to expect – Vanderbilt to have a 60,000 seat stadium filled with 50,000 of its own fans. But I think you work with what's realistic and you try to make that happen. Yeah. I I think there are a lot of schools that right now, if they could magically shrink their stadium, they would do it. But that's the, that's the, that's the hard part, right? How do you shrink your stadium? But that is something that Vanderbilt has at least something up their sleeve. If they want to take a look at the soccer stadium or, you know, renovate their stadium to where there are less seats. It's not. It's it's not a bad idea. I think. It's, I think that's the trend nationwide that we're going to see. Let's go quickly to the mailbag, which is sponsored by Vanderbilt Fan and Independent Insurance Agent Josh Minton of Brentwood. Are you in the market for auto, motorcycle, home renters, or landlord insurance? What about life or commercial insurance? Josh has got you covered. Call him 615-933-1979. Email him at josh at hqinsurance.com. Follow him on Facebook. That is facebook.com slash JD Minton HQ. He's my insurance agent. Hope you will make him yours. Vandy always says, do you know what's going on with Pedro Alvarez? Is he completely out of baseball now? Now, I have researched the question a little bit in advance. He was released by the New Orleans Baby Cakes. I think that's in the Marlins system. I can't keep up anymore, and he's not had an at-bat this year. I don't know if he's hung it up or not, Willie, but maybe you, you have some info there. Uh, I, I'm not sure about that. I do think he was playing for, for a while. Uh, I saw that uh, Ryan Flaherty, his teammate, uh, classmate, did get called up uh, for, for the stretch run in the month of October uh, after playing Triple A. I think most of the season, so that was nice to see. Uh, but Pedro, I'm not, I'm not sure where he is. But, but that you, you're right. I think everything that you said was was accurate. I have not seen what's going on the last couple of weeks, but uh, you know. Great. I mean, you talk about a player that was a very important guy to sort of swing and jumpstart where the program is, the type of recruit he was, uh, the leverage he had to go pro out of high school. I thought, you know, he's, he's one of the more his, historically significant Vanderbilt baseball players, I think, in this whole Tim Corbin era. Last question. 
This says, what is your impression of Jerry Stackhouse's first six months? Specifically, do you have a perspective on his first recruiting class and the prospects he has targeted for 2020? I, you know, I, I think it's very, very early to judge one way or the other how it's going to go. I, I think we've got to give Jerry Stackhouse some time before you can really put an evaluation on it. He, he's got a very different approach. It is de- definitely outside the box. I think the challenge is going to be, or what he's going to need to find, is how does he find the right people for Vanderbilt? I think everything he's done and the resources he be- he's been given it's pretty exciting. Like he's got an Im- he's got an immense staff. You know, I think locally. <laughs> You know, on the high school football level, level, it reminds me of what Trent Dilper has been doing at Lipscomb Academy, right? They've given him a ton of of resources. He's got a huge staff. That's all great. But for Jerry Stackhouse, it's not just about finding good players. It's also finding good players who want to come to Vanderbilt, value going to school at Vanderbilt, and molding the two together. I think he's got a pretty good vision, a pretty good eye for what – what can win and what can, uh, you know, be the type of player that can develop into a pro player. I think I've heard him talk about that a lot, but I think you've also got to be able to find the, the really good college basketball player that may not go on to the NBA. Maybe he goes off and plays, you know, some, some years in Europe or things like that, but you got to get mileage out of the players on your roster that don't go to the NBA because it's not going to be like North Carolina or Duke or some of the programs that he was most associated with back when he was a college player that might have, you know, pretty much everybody on the roster aspiring to play pro. You see what I'm saying? It's a, it's a blend. It'd be great. It's going to be great. If he can get more players that, that project maybe as NBA talent, but I think realistically he's going to need more than that. He's going to need that, that second level player. That's an excellent Vanderbilt college basketball player, but may not be an NBA player. Willie, thank you so much for your time today. I want to give you the floor to tell people about your shows, where they can find them, and give out your Twitter account before we end the show today. All right. Well, now that we're past Labor Day, uh, the the Predators are going to get cranking up here pretty soon, and so that's uh, I'll be certainly getting cranked up with that along with it uh, over the next few weeks on Fox Sports Tennessee. Um But I'm on the flagship station of the Predators, 102.5 The Game. Our sports talk show is from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. every week. Uh, A lot of you may be familiar with uh, Mitch Light, the sideline reporter for Vanderbilt. He joins us every Tuesday at noon. Of course, he is the Athlon College Football uh, Managing Editor, so we talk a lot of college football with him, but we definitely have a lot of Vanderbilt influence there. So uh, we we talk a lot of doors on our show. So everybody, uh, make sure they're listening. You can follow me at Willie D, Willie with a Y, 1025 on Twitter. Thank you so much, Willie. All right, Chris. We'll talk to you again soon. You bet. He's Willie Donick of 1025 The Game. I'm Chris Levy, host of the Vandy Sports Podcast. Thanks for listening. We'll have more of these coming later this week.